Hi, I'm going to be reading aloud The Dangerous Life of Harriet Hansen, 10-Year-Old Mill Girl. It would be a good idea to get out your reading packet so you can follow along as I read. Um, this is written as a play, so it might be fun to, you know, get family members together, brothers, sisters, mom or dad, and you guys could divvy up the characters just like we do in class when there is a play, and you could read it together. Um, if you're working on this by yourself, though, you could um, just follow along as I listen. So scene one, narrator one. It's 4.30 in the morning. Ten-year-old Harriet Hansen hears a loud clanging of the factory bell. Her eyes fly open. She is excited and nervous. Today is her first day of work at the mill. Many factories were built in Lowell, Massachusetts in the 1830s. Each factory hired hundreds of workers to run its machines. Most of these workers were young girls like Harriet. That's because factory owners didn't have to pay the girls much, and the girls had small hands and quick fingers. At the factory, Harriet walks up to Mr. Troot. Harriet, since you are so small, you will be a bobbin girl. You know what a bobbin is, don't you? It's a big spool that catches the thread. That's right. Come with me. Mr. Trot leaves Harriet to the bottom floor of the factory. When Harriet enters the room, she is nearly blown over by the roar of the machines. Your job is to take these bobbins full of thread off of the spinning frames and replace them with empty ones. The bobbins are heavy. If you don't want to lift them, I'll find someone who can. No, I can do it. We stop the machine for you to change the bobbin, but you must be fast. Every second the machines are stopped, the company loses money. Scene two. Most of the mill girls lived in boarding houses. These were large homes built by the factory owners. As many as 50 or 60 workers lived in each house. Each day, Harriet starts work at 5 a.m. She works for 14 hours with only a few short breaks. Her body aches, but she's proud to be earning money for her family. One afternoon, Harriet is crawling under the dangerous spinning machines, cleaning up dust and loose thread. I'm so hot. It must be 95 degrees in here. The windows are nailed shut. Hot steam is sprayed in the air so the threads don't dry out and break. Scene three. As the town of Lowell grew, there were more mills trying to get business. Factory owners struggled to find ways to sell their cloth and keep making money. Trot had, Trot, I've had to lower our prices. The girls need to make more cloth. I've already made them speed up their work. They must work faster. Sir, that will produce lumpy thread and uneven cloth. You won't be able to sell it. Then we have to pay them less. The girls gathered during a break. I heard something terrible. What? They are cutting our pay. But that's not fair. Right now, we only make $2 a week. But here's the worst part. The owners are going to make us pay more to live in their boarding houses. What can we do? Margaret looks around to make sure the boss is not nearby. Some girls are organizing a turnout. What's that? A strike where we walk out of the mill and refuse to work. If all the girls in the factory do it, the owners will have to pay attention to us. Go on strike, we'll get fired for sure. The company is not treating us fairly. Shouldn't we stand up for our rights? This makes sense to Harriet, she listens closely. The girls upstairs have created a group called the Factory Girls Association. They say they will help all the girls who turn out. I can't stop working. The money I send home is paying for my brother's school. Plus, if we strike, we'll be broke and have nowhere to live. I know it sounds scary, but if we don't look out for ourselves, who will? Scene four. The day of the strike arrives. The girls on the upper floors stop working. 
Harriet watches out the window as dozens of girls go outside. Her heart pounds. As more girls leave, the machines stop. The silence is eerie. Nobody on Harriet's floor knows what to do. Harriet surprises everyone by exclaiming loudly, I am going to turn out even if no one else does. She marches out with her head held high. In the yard, Harriet turns around and sees a long line of girls behind her. She is surprised, but happy. Nearly 2,000 mill girls march through the streets chanting, The factory owners want to make more money, so they're cutting our pay. Boo! We are not machines. No. We are human beings with rights and feelings, and we will not return to work until they agree to pay us what is fair. Hooray! Scene 5. After the strike, the factory owners still cut the girls' pay. The strikers were upset. Some quit and went home. Others went back to work because they had no other options. The strike didn't change things right away. But the movement that Harriet and the other protesters started was like a seed that would grow and grow. Harriet worked at the mill for many years. She always fought for the rights of the workers. The Factory Girls Association became powerful. The working day later went down to 10 hours. For the rest of her life, Harriet spoke out for women's rights, and she never forgot how it felt when she and the girls walked out of the factory. I was more proud than I have ever been.